My name is Vicky and I'm Fran and you're listening to Five Valleys Production Story Slam. Story Slam is a collection of true stories told live by performers in training at Stroud College. Story Slam is inspired by the moth. The Moth is a podcast and live event where everyday people can share their stories and experiences through the art of storytelling. Our stories today are about persuasion. Do you ever feel like luck is just around the corner? Do something that seems great at the time, but in the end was a bad decision? Feel like a hero, but someone's taken away your cape? Well, now we invite you to listen to our first story, The Airing Cupboard by Ben Robinson. So... When I was younger, I went to boarding school, and we were put in dorms. So I shared a room, a dorm with my mates, and in this dorm, there was a cupboard. I had no idea, anyone knew, had no idea what was behind this cupboard. So we are in this room for about a year. It's lo- this cupboard was always locked, it never opened. Only one day, it was unlocked. So I thought it would be a very good idea to hide in this cupboard and to scare someone. So I was, I was in this cupboard straight away and I thought, okay, it's an airing cupboard. There are three radiators in here and they're all on and it's the summer. So I, okay, I'll be in here for about five minutes tops. So about 10 minutes later, I'm still in this cupboard. My friend eventually walks in the door and I scream, I burst out and he's so scared he throws his books in the air and I hit the ceiling. So I was laughing so much uncontrollably, I was on the floor. I was walking back, so I was still in the cupboard. All of a sudden, he gets up, <laughs> slams the door and locks it. So I am stuck in this airing cupboard on a boiling hot day with three radiators on and I can't switch them off. So I'm like, okay, what do I do here? Eventually, he, my, fr- my other friends come and they're like, okay, Ben, what we're going to do is we're going to go to lunch. So I was like, hang on, wait, what? <laughs> it was a Friday. It was my favourite day of the week. So it was fish and chips for lunch. And they just went off without me. Didn't even do anything. Didn't even, they, they said, okay, we'll come up with a plan at lunch. I was like, oh, okay. So as I was pretty much suffocating in this room, as it was so hot, I needed air. And there was a small window in the corner of the room. So I hung my head out the window. I was there for about five minutes. And then all of a sudden, from the other side of the building, I saw a little head pop up. (laughs) And it was my mate. And he was Spanish, so basically what he said, Ben, Ben, climb out the window. (laughs) And I was like, oh, oh, okay. I looked down, and the roof was like this. So I was like, I can't do that. If I fall, I'll probably will break something. Or I'll get expelled. So I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to climb out the window. So I was still hanging out this window. About 10 minutes later, my friends finally get back. I'm like, okay, finally. Okay, Ben, what are we going to do? We're going to kick the door down. I was like, okay. They're like, Ben, Ben, stand back. You don't want to get hit by the door. I was like, okay, okay. He goes, okay, ready? Three, two, one. Ooh. It was all I heard from the other side of that door. It was still in one tact. It didn't even move. So then I was like, okay. And then one of the boys said, okay, I'll better go and get a key. I was like, hang on, what? You haven't even asked for a key yet. And he was like, no. So I was like, okay. So he eventually got a key or found someone with a key. And they were moaning and mumbling. I can't really remember what they were saying. But when they opened the door, all I remember is seeing shrapnels of wood all over the floor, and I was like, where has this come from? So I look at the door, and there's a hole about this big in the door. And I'm like, oh God, what have they done? And she goes, okay, what you've done, you've got to pay for this, you're in there. I was like, hang on, whoa. I was the victim in the situation. Thank you. Each 
of our storytellers were asked to come up with a tagline for their story. Ben's tagline was, I thought an airing cupboard was a safe place to be. Maybe an airing cupboard wasn't the safest option, perhaps a wardrobe. Seems like Ben didn't have much luck at first, but let's see if Lana Simmons did in her story, Did I Get Lucky? If there was one thing I always wished for as a child, it was to have my very own dog, but my parents always said no. I loved dogs from the age of probably two when I realised what they were, and my family members had dogs. My uncle and auntie, they had two shih tzus called JJ and Albion, and they were quite old, so usually I would just sit there stroking and cuddling them. And my other two uncle and aunties also had two shih tzus, no, two Yorkshire Terriers as well, um, called Tilly and Jasper, and I used to play with them all the time as well. So I wanted my very own dog, so I asked for a birthday and Christmas all the time, but it just wasn't happening. So I decided I'd just become a dog myself. <laughs> so um, every day I would just be running around on my hands and knees barking all the time. <laughs> and because I love Disney as well, I used to pretend to be the different Disney characters like 101 Dalmatians, Lady in the Tramp, Copper from Fox and the Hound, Bolt, and um, my sister used to play Penny as well, so we'd go on different missions and it'd be really fun. <laughs> and my granny used to buy me stuffed dogs every week as well. Every time I went around our house, it was great because I had a massive tub of them by the end of whenever. <laughs> and also, there was this one incident when I was behind the sofa in my house and my dad wanted to get me out. So he was like, Lanka, can you get f out from behind the sofa? And I was like, well, no, call me Lucky, I'm a dog. <laughs> and he was like, no, you're Lanika, come out. I was like, well, no, you're not calling me by my dog name. So <laughs> in the end, he must have just been too frustrated, so he just left me, which is kind of understandable because having a barking human around the house all the time is probably frustrating. <laughs> but yeah, I was just a dog constantly, to be honest. Um, this one Christmas, I was... Um, given this animatronic dog and because I said if I got a real dog I would stop pretending to be a dog myself um, so they was like here you go we've got you a dog and I was like well no that's not real I want a real dog <laughs> I'm still gonna be a dog and it was kind of hard because my dad didn't like dogs and my mum was bitten by a dog in the face when she was younger by an Alsatia so she's quite like wary of dogs <laughs> But this one day, I was at my friend's house, and my mum and dad came to collect me randomly, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, I didn't expect it. I was, thought I was going to stay there longer. But they was like, no, we're going somewhere. Come on. So I was like, okay, where are we going? And they was like, well, you just have to wait and see. So I just got in the car, and we was on this long journey. And we arrived at this house. And as I'm approaching this house, it opens up, and paradise literally floods towards me as these adorable and fluffy King Charles Cavalier Spaniels are bouncing and barking about. By now, I'm like so excited, like, oh my God, are we getting a dog? Please, are we getting a dog? And they're like, yes, we're getting a dog. And I was going to get a male dog because my dad was the only male in the family. <laughs> so it was kind of frustrating for him, like having three girls in the house going on at him all the time. But instead, I found this adorable girl and we fell in love with her straight away so we chose her and we took her home the next day and I knew exactly what I was going to call her simply lucky because I was just way too lucky to have her and nine years from then we I still have my gorgeous girl and she's the best thing that's ever happened to me who says a dog's just a man's best friend <laughs> thank you Lanika's tagline was Five years of wishing. I guess her luck was just a cute ball of fluff with four legs. Luck does come in many shapes and sizes. Coming up next, a girl of one wish, Sean Gogoli, with her story, The Splash. Okay, so when I was four years old, um, my parents decided to bring me on holiday to Blackpool to see the eliminations. It was my first big holiday with my parents. I was so excited. I was only about four, it, but it was about October and the time of year, October, November time. We got there. We ended up going into a small B&B. It was lovely. Um, I, being a four-year-old, wanted to go on the beach. As soon as seeing the beach, I was so excited. I wanted to go on the beach. But it was October. It was cold. My parents were like, no, you're going to freeze if you go on down to the beach. 
was like, no, but, you know, I was shaking. I was so excited. I wanted to go on the beach. They're like, no, no, you can't go on the beach. It's too cold. So in the end, they, they reluctantly took me down to the beach. And I was like, mum, dad, I want to go in the sea. And they were like, no, 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 it's too cold. And if you've ever been to Blackpool, you know it goes quite far out at Blackpool. So my dad was like, why don't we, why don't we run in this puddle instead? It's, it's, you know, it'll be all right. So he takes his socks and shoes off and he sort of runs through it. Then he goes up to about his ankles. So I'm there, I'm like, yeah, I'm really excited to go in this puddle. I've seen the illuminations. I'm like, I want to go in the puddle. So I take my socks off. I take my, I had little buckle up shoes on, took my little buckle up shoes off. Rolled my trousers up, <laughs> was bracing myself for this cold, wet, soggy puddle, as all kids would love to jump into it. <laughs> I run up to it. I'm literally there. I'm like, oh. In I went, and up to my knees it came. My whole trousers absorbed just all the water from the puddle. <laughs> then the immediate reaction, the the true human function kicked in of sh shivering. I was chilly, shivering. My teeth started going, like chattering. So there I was shaking. And my, my mum and my dad turned to me and they said, listen, you've got to get out. It's, it's too cold. <laughs> You're going to catch something if you stay in there. Plus, we're going for dinner afterwards. So we need to get you some new trousers on before we go to dinner. Uh, you can't sit there soggy in a restaurant. So we went. So I was reluctantly stood there going, it's not cold, Dad. <laughs> it's refreshing. <laughs> and this went on for about f four minutes. Come out, you need to come out now. No, it's refreshing. So they finally get me out. They persuade me to the fact that we're going to dinner and the cold sea air, you've smelt the sea air, the salt hits you, makes you hungry. So I was getting hungry, so I came out, and we went and found myself some new trousers. So I ended up wearing, I chose them myself, and I remember them to this day. They were pink and sparkly, and we went for dinner, which was brilliant. And then after that, I've always thought, I always thought twice about jumping in a puddle. And that was Shan with her tagline. Not your typical British holiday. It does sound like a great weekend. Here is Joe Oram's story called Lovely Weekend. So this story starts off basically when I used to go to the Army Cadets, which was about a year ago. And it was just a normal parade night. And a parade night is basically where, you know, you just get together, do some drill, saluting, marching, and all that, etc. Uh, at the end of the night, our platoon commander mentioned this one weekend that was kind of coming up. There was Gatcombe Horse Trials. It's basically where the cadets go, they volunteer, you know, they help out opening and closing gates for the horses, putting up jumps and all that stuff. So I thought, yeah, you know, it'd be all right for experience and everything. And he basically said that, you know, if we want to give our platoon a good name, then we should go there. So I want all cadets to be attending this weekend, you know, bring a sleeping bag, pack a load of food and everything. And yeah, so I thought, yeah, it'd be all right, you know, it'd be pretty cool, you know, horses and everything. So, yeah. I uh, went home, packed my bag, got my sleeping bag, uniform, kit, pretty much everything I needed. My neighbor dropped me off at the field where we were camping at the weekend. Um, it started off pretty good, you know, I mean, everyone was having a laugh, we were playing, you know, we set up our camps and everything and had some s'mores, so it was going pretty smoothly. Uh, bearing in mind, this was like in the middle of December as well, so it was just beyond freezing, I mean, like frostbite cold as well. So. Um, Nighttime came, we started settling down, you know, I was in a tent with about three other guys and one of them was a Lance Corporal. It wasn't my tent, it was his tent, so I had to like take care of it and everything. But um, yeah, basically, with my sleeping bag, because I had my sleeping bag set out, I hadn't used it in about two or three years, so I slightly was outgrown in it. And it was <laughs> just, just a bit, just a bit. <laughs> but um, yeah, I couldn't fit in it at all. I couldn't zip it up or anything because it was just too small and whenever I tried to like forcefully zip it up the zip broke so basically I couldn't wrap myself with the sleeping bag or anything so I had to sleep in my uniform because it was just too cold to be sleeping in like your pajamas and everything 
So the night went by about a couple of hours later. I couldn't sleep at all. The rest of the guys hit the sack. I had no idea what they did. It was too bloody cold for me. But yeah, I had to sleep without a sleeping bag. I didn't go to sleep at all. And um, it got to the point where I actually started hallucinating in the cold because I was that cold. Because um, my teeth were, you know, like, like how Scooby-Doo, whenever he gets scared, you know, he chatters his teeth. That was basically me throughout the whole night. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I started hallucinating from the coldness, and basically my hallucination was I was at home, I was on the toilet, <laughs> and uh, basically that went on for about a couple of minutes, and whenever I woke up, whenever I gained consciousness, I was kind of still on the toilet, just a bit, and um, <laughs> yeah, because um, when I woke up, I was squatting down, so I thought, what am I doing here, what's going on? And I looked down, and yeah, long story short, my uh, sleeping bag was completely ruined. It was all over my uniform, <laughs> my combat jacket. <laughs> there was a massive puddle in the middle of the tent. The rest of the guys were still sleeping. I was still processing this. I didn't know what was going on at all. And um, yeah, when I finally, when my, when my mind came together and everything, I realized, oh, what have I done? You know, I can't believe I've done this. You know, it's everywhere. It's, it was even over my hands and everything. I don't know how it got there, but it just did. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I took a couple of minutes cleaning it up, like, you know, sorting things out. So my sleeping bag was completely useless by then because it was just damp and wet. But um, the color sergeant, who was sleeping next to us, he had his tent next to us. He heard me scuffling around, like, unzipping my bag and everything. It was, like, five in the morning, so he was really not happy at all. You know, he came charging out of his tent. He was pretty mad at me. He came in. He was like, what the bloody hell is going on here? And he basically, my pants were still down at this point as well. <laughs> So he looks down, he sees me, and he looks back up as if I've just offended his great ancestors. And he's just looking at me for about five seconds, and you know, he has this really like gritty, serious voice, and he just says to me, you bloody failure, and he just walks out. So basically at that point, he was just tired of my crap, and I couldn't blame him at all, I couldn't believe what I just did. So yeah, I had to, like another five minutes went by, and I'm still cleaning up everything, you know, I'm trying to, like I'm stepping out, of the tent because I had to take off my uniform that I was sleeping in because it was all wet and everything so I had to let it dry for the next morning because I couldn't go out on duty when you know it's everywhere so yeah I had to get in my pajamas go outside uh, lay my uniform down on the grass and it was freezing outside and I was in my pajamas I didn't have anything else to wrap myself up with because it was all wet and I stayed out there for about five minutes waiting for it to dry and yeah that happened everyone else was still asleep I you know I don't know how they were still asleep but yeah um, yeah, so it all dried. Um, I had to go to the rest of the line, but I'm a sleeping bag. Um, I didn't sleep at all, so the next morning came. I was still awake. Got up for duty, you know, my uniform had dried, so it was all good. But it was raining, like raining a lot, like the storm was just unbelievable. It was hailstones, the mud was like literally up to here in our boots and everything, like water got inside our boots. So it was like a whole seven hours a day just in that weather it was horrendous. But, um, Anyways, uh, about a couple more hours went by. I was working on the gates, and basically the whole job of the gates is opening and closing the gates for the horses. It was a pretty simple and easy job. So yeah, I did that for a while, and I was on break. So I decided to go to the toilet. And basically, wherever my hands were so cold, like I couldn't move them, I could literally move them like that much, and that was about it, because I had frostbite everywhere. So whenever I tried going to the portaloo, I couldn't open the door. It took me like two minutes to try and like get a grip on the door to open it. So I got that done, that was out of the way. Then it was closing the door. That was like another 30 seconds. There was um, taking off my pants, which was another three minutes, maybe, at least. And um, you know how you guys are where, you know, where you're actually going to the toilet, you need to hold a certain thing, right? <laughs> Basically, my hands were cold at that point, and it kind of slipped out of my hands a bit. <laughs> Like, not trying to... <laughs> so, yeah, um, I kind of wet myself again that morning. <laughs> it was on my uh, combat pants, and I missed the toilet completely, and I was trying to get the toilet paper out to clean, to clean up, but I just couldn't get a grip of the toilet paper, and I couldn't, like, do my belts up or anything, so I was kind of... I was in there for another hour. And when I came out, because my break was only 15 minutes long, you know, the color sergeant, he was, he was pissed. He was really pissed at me. <laughs> You know, um, he didn't see it this time, which was good. But yeah, he, you know, he came over, he was swearing, he was shouting, you know, he was dragging me by the collar. He was not happy at all. 
So I was back on duty on the gates again, and then the hellstorm came. You know, hellstones, you know, they just fall from the sky and everything. But yeah, this was really, really heavy. It felt like BB pellets hitting the back of your ears. So me and a couple of other cadets, we had to take cover behind this tractor. And we were there for about seven minutes while this massive hellstorm was just constantly just like raining down upon us. And I had this horrible thought in my head, this realization that I have just left. Because I was the last one to leave the tent and I left the door open. And basically, in, in, like the worst thing is, it's not my tent, it's Lance Corporal's tent as well. I was just staying in there. And all of their equipment were in there, you know, their phones, their uniforms, their clothes, their bags, their sleeping bags, everything was in there. So I had to sprint back to the tent, just praying, just praying that, you know, it was facing in the other direction and none of it went in. When I got there, there was a puddle about this big, like filling the entire tent. And I, I could see everyone's iPads and phones just floating above it as well. <laughs> so, yeah, um... I was kind of screwed there for a bit. So basically what I did was I took down the entire tent. I tried to like empty out the puddle. So I was getting everyone's equipment out and everything. Color sergeant comes back again because I'm late for my shift again. He's pissed at me, you know, once again. And uh, he comes, he's swearing, he's shouting and all that. You know, the tent's like half made and half like collapsed. So basically, you know, he came, he told me to get back on duty. I went on duty and the tent was just on the floor because I was trying to deconstruct it. So basically I made it look like the storm had just knocked it over. And, uh, yeah, I made, made a little like snow nuts over. Everyone was still on their shifts as well. Another couple of hours went by, but the weekend was cut short because the weather was just too bad. So my neighbor come, he picked me up, he drove me down the road. And as I was driving down the road, I could see, like, the guys, especially the Lance Corporal, they were at their tents and they were just fuming it. They were pissed off. They were kicking it. They were chucking their phones and everything because everything was just completely ruined, you know. So, but they never found out, so it was all good, you know. <laughs> Then I went home, and honestly, from the storms, from the horrible nights and everything, I looked like I literally just got back from Vietnam. Uh, my mother ran me a bath, you know, bless her and everything. I fell asleep in the bath, you know, choked on the bath water when I woke up and had a cold for about two days, so yeah, the misery didn't end there. And uh, yeah, a lot of other horrible things happened to me, but for the sake of keeping my friends, I think I'm just going to leave those out. But uh, so yeah, that was GATCOM. Thank you. <laughs> Joe's tagline is Misery in Gatcombe. It seems that tents and sleeping bags really want his thing back then. Story Slam is the first part of our Sonder project. Sonder is inspired by the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows coined by John Koenig. He gives meaning to feelings or emotions that we don't have in the English language. The definition of Sonder being the realisation that every passerby has a life as vivid and complex as your own. More on that later. Going camping isn't always the easiest thing to do, but you know what the woods remind me of? What? Robin Hood! <laughs> well, we seem to have the perfect story coming up next. Cassie Riches and her story, Robin Hood of Bristol. When you're 16, there are many opportunities that are opened up to you, and one of them is NCS. NCS is a government-run programme called the National Citizen Service, and I signed up for the summer programme for four weeks with my friend April. And as part of this, you are taken on a week of outdoor activities, a uni experience, and then two weeks of doing community or voluntary work. And this is to help you boost your CV. So I thought, yeah, give it a go. May as well. Um, it's only for 16 and 17 year olds, so I didn't have a lot of time to like do things like this. Um, so it got to the third week and we were asked to come up with our own project. And we chose to do the box project, which was collecting donations to give to the homeless of Bristol and Gloucester. And we first off struggled to come up with ideas that actually worked to get donations. Uh, we came up with ideas like sponsored fun run, fun runs and uh, bag packs at supermarkets. But we faced a lot of rejection for that. We None of the emails that we sent out got responses from. Uh, I tried to ring up Tesco's and three times they told me to go on their website. So in the end, we resolved to what I call legal begging, which is where you take buckets out onto the streets and you ask people to give their spare change. So 
we reluctantly went to Poundland and bought six black buckets, which we created little signs for saying the name of our project and that we were part of NCS. And we sorted ourselves out into three separate groups and we stationed ourselves in separate parts of Bristol. And I was with two other girls and we were put in Cabot Circus. So we, before we began, we thought the best way to approach this is to act confident because people will feel better about giving their money to you if you're friendly and outgoing and say hi, care to give us a 50p. <laughs> uh, so we tried this out. I think we got to like three people where we just thought, okay, this isn't what we thought because everywhere we went with our bucket, we were shot sharp, disapproving looks by everybody. And we were kind of a bit unsure about this. And after about half an hour, probably not even that, our confidence was battered to the ground by all this. And we, we, were, we were to the point where we just decided, you know what, maybe we should just go and hide in the streets to pretend that we'd done it. Um, so with our sad, empty buckets swinging by our sides, we walked out onto the streets. And what I saw before me was absolutely beautiful. There was this police horse and he was, well, in my opinion, he was a big horse. And he had like a lovely sh shiny bay coat. And as we were walking across the corner, I couldn't take my eyes off him. And unfortunately, I failed to recognize the fact that his rider was talking into his radio. So two minutes later, we found ourselves being approached by a policeman. And he told us that we were actually committing offen an offence because we weren't a registered charity. And I've always done what I've been told. I've always been a good girl. I've, and this was going against any expectation that I had of myself. I thought, even though it was quite minor, a minor situation at the time, I blew it up it, it out of proportion. And I was like, oh my God, I'm actually like facing arrest. And the other girls were fine about it. They were like, okay, yeah. I mean, the policeman was all right. Uh, he just sent us around Bristol for two hours, wasting our time trying to get us permission from people that had already said no. Um, and this was quite a big thing for me. Almost getting arrested out on the streets of Bristol. And it was all for a single two pound coin sat in the bo bottom of my bucket. Um, but we finally, were able to convince the policeman that we were okay because we had didn't actually know that we were unregistered. Because even though NCS is, uh, like they do that kind of thing, they send people out asking for money to raise for charity, but they didn't think to tell us that we had to have legal registration and they don't have that. Um, so one of many experiences that I have I had on NCS, uh, wasn't great, but I did learn a very good lesson. Uh, if you were to ask me back, I'd have to say no thank you. <laughs> thank you. Doing good deed is a good Samaritan. Really has its ups and downs, doesn't it? Cass's tagline was, it all starts with no thank you. We have had so many great stories so far, but the best has been saved for last. There is no way that you won't be able to stop listening to this one. Introducing April Wiseman with her story, The Hills Are Alive with the Sound of Screaming. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't really understand music. To me, it was this big alien world that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And in all honesty, I was quite happy with my Barbie dolls, my Cindy's, my Bratz. Like, nah, I was good. But as time got on, I started to think, I don't get music, and then everyone else is a part of it. I mean, my mum listens to music, my dad listens to music, my sister listens to music. Maybe I should try and get involved, you know? It could be like a good conversation starter. Now, my dad's music taste absolutely terrified me. It was loud, there was shouting, no, 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 I wasn't down for that. 
So in the end, I took refuge in my sister's music taste. Now my older sister, Steph, she listened to lots of like early 2000s pop, definitely Barbie Girl in there, that was on my pink iPod. So, you know, it was okay, this music, I, I didn't know any better, so okay, great, I'll start listening to it. And my sister was really great, she'd play me songs, show me different things to look at and listen to, and it was really exciting. Until the day she said to me, so April, how's about this? I'll make you a CD, but what artists and bands do you want on it? Uh, <coughs> uh um, yeah, yeah. I mean, nine-year-old me, I didn't know any artists. I certainly didn't know any bands. I didn't know the difference between artists and bands. <laughs> I mean, what? So luckily, I was fairly intelligent then, and I'd just seen an advert on TV with different songs, so I was like, great, I'll just list them. Yeah, I, um, I listened to JLS <laughs> and um, N-dubs. Yeah, and um, uh, those black eyed peas, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? And my sister didn't really get it. I mean, she'd never played me this music, so she didn't know how I'd found out about it, but yeah, okay, yeah, sure, I'll make you this CD, she said. And I listened to it on my lovely pink CD player that matched my bedroom. And you know what, like now it was a little bit crap, but at the time I loved it, it was amazing, but after 50 or so plays in a day, it got pretty boring. I mean, I knew the songs, I knew the artists by then. And I wanted more. I wanted some more music to play around with, something different. So bearing this in mind, one day I go down the stairs, my dad's just marking some work from his students, and I can hear this music. It's really heavy and dark, really mysterious. And I kind of like it. <laughs> so I just stroll past, like, hey, Dad, everything all right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, what are you listening to? <laughs> and he said Black Sabbath. Now, I'd never heard of Black Sabbath before, but I did find out they were a band. So it, it really interested me. I mean, I'd never listened to this type of music before, but I liked it. I liked how dark and heavy and creepy. It was eerie, people were shouting, and it was quite good. Now, I mean, the music I'd listened to before had all just been pop and happy, clappy, fun things. So I didn't know, it confused me. I mean, my dad and I, we'd, nev we'd always been opposites. Maybe I was more like him than I expected. So then I decide, I'm gonna borrow this CD, dad's at work. Shh. Rummage through the CDs and I find the one I want. Black Sabbath, Paranoid. The album cover has a man brandishing a sword, looking very badass. <laughs> Why not? I'll take it. So I put this CD and think, right, what's going to be the song that makes it? And I decide on Iron Man. thumping beat of the song starts, the eerie robotic voice playing in the background. And I can't describe how it made me feel. This music was so exciting to me. It was so different and out there to anything I'd ever heard. And I loved it. I just wanted more and more. And I knew at that point that I had found the music that would make me who I am. And since then, I've listened to lots more Black Sabbath. My tastes have ventured into lots of screamo music, which I now repress and pretend I didn't like when I was 14 and I went really emo. <coughs> <coughs> but yeah, and I think through Black Sabbath, I found so many amazing artists. And although with the whole metal, alternative, rock, a lot of people think, it's just screaming for the sake of screaming. It's pointless, just a chain and a cycle of constant screaming. But to me, it's so much more than that. These songs, they have such prominent, strong messages behind them. And it's really about the emotion and the feeling. 
it's not just pointless screaming. It's so, so much more. Now, I may have found a style of music that I like, but I don't think I'll ever understand music. Thank you. Black Sabbath, or JLS, you know what to choose. April's tagline was, am I going insane? Frankly, I think music is such a hard question to ask these days, with the new songs out every month. That's it for this episode. Thank you to all our performers for their stories. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Join us in December for the second half of our Sonder project with our Sonder Story Slam. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye.